So welcome, everyone. I want to thank you uh, for coming and joining us today for what we expect will be a lively and engaging conversation between artist Sadie Barnett and writer, critic, and podcaster Carvel Wallace. This Artist on Artwork event celebrates the acquisition of Barnett's photo bar and is hosted in conjunction with Don't Forget to Call Your Mother, an exhibition on view in the Joyce F. Menschel Hall, Gallery 851 on the museum's second floor. I hope you will go see the exhibition if you haven't already. The exhibition includes work by 14 artists in the Met Collection, spanning the 1970s to the present, that inspire reflection on the power of found objects and the complicated feelings of nostalgia and sentimentality they can conjure. Employing a range of methods and strategies from intimate meditation on the family to conceptual consideration of corporate media archives, the artists in the exhibition consider how tactile images can forge links across time and transform our understanding of the present. Today, we welcome Sadie Barnett to the Met. Barnett's multimedia practice illuminates her own family history as it mirrors a collective history of, repres of repression and resistance in the United States. Her adept materialization of the archive rises above a static reference, reverence for the past by inserting herself into the retelling she offers a history that is alive. Her drawings, photographs, and installations collapse time and expand possibilities. Political and social structures are a jumping off point for the work, but they are not the final destination. Recent projects include the reclamation of a 500-page FBI surveillance file amassed on her father during his time with the Black Panther Party and her interactive reimagining of his bar, San Francisco's first Black-owned gay bar. Photo Bar, one of the featured works in the show, acts as an altar to the new Eagle Creek Saloon, celebrates the community it embraced, opening a portal to this forgotten history and to a chapter in her father's life. Barnett holds a BFA from CalArts and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego, and her work is in many museum collections in addition to the Met. She has enjoyed solo exhibitions at The Kitchen, New York, Pomona College, Los Angeles, the ICA, Los Angeles, the Museum of the African Diaspora, San Francisco, MCA, San Diego, among many others. She's the recipient of numerous grants and residencies, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, Artadia, Art Matters, Eureka Fellowship, Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and many others. Thank you, Sadie, for bringing your vibe and your embrace to the Met. Today, Sadie will be in conversation with Carvel Wallace. Wallace is a journalist, culture critic, best-selling author, and award-winning podcaster who has covered race, culture, music, cinema, sports, and human interest for a wide variety of outlets, including The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, MTV, Glamour, Esquire, GQ, and others. His 2017 semi-autobiographical -autobi podcast, Closer Than They Appear, won a Kaleidoscope Award from the Radio Television Digital News Association, and his 2019 podcast, Finding Fred, which you must go find, was nominated for a Peabody Award. He also co-wrote The Sixth Man with retired Golden State Warriors forward Andre Iguodala, a book which spent 14 weeks as a bestseller, was nominated for a California Book Award and named to Obama's year-end list. His forthcoming memoir, Another Word for Love, makes a personal, spiritual, and political case for finding liberation by addressing trauma and is due out on May 14th. Morgan Parker has called Wallace a staggeringly talented storyteller, and author, author Melissa Fabos has said that the book brims with humility and insight. He is based in Oakland, California, and is a regular moderator for City Arts and Lectures in San Francisco. What a privilege to be with you both today for what I know will be a memorable conversation. Please join me in welcoming Sadie Barnett. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us and thank you so much, Lisa, for not only that wonderful introduction, but for so thoughtfully curating my work um, in conversation with some artists and pieces that have been foundational to my thinking about my work and the exhibition is so beautiful as well as challenging and, um, you know, it's not easy, but it's easy to look at <laughs> and I think that's often a great strategy for getting people thinking. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Fran, and everyone who organized this event for having us today. And thank you guys for braving a little bit of gray weather. I guess it's not that bad for New Yorkers. Um, but 
yeah, I'm just going to talk, like, kind of try to run through some of my work just to give you some visuals and uh, a context that um, can kind of ground the conversation that me and Carvel will have this afternoon. So I'll be a little quick, but hopefully there'll be some stuff for us to think about together. And I always just want to start by thanking those that came before me, both um, before me on this land, before me in my profession, my ancestors and my family. And a little bit of context for y'all. I'm from Oakland, California. I use photography, drawing, sculpture, installation, wallpapers, couches, whatever I need um, to tell my story, my family's story as it relates to global histories. But I also honestly do this as a way of just witnessing and grounding and moving through the world. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about some kind of wide ranging different material interventions that connect my practice. And I always like to point out that talking about the work is not the work itself. I hope that, um, I mean, for some people that's their work, but it's, it's not my work. But I hope that by talking about it, it kind of you know welcomes you into it and that hopefully when you experience it for yourself, there's things that are happening beyond language and beyond what I can explain. But this is an entry point. Um, so this first piece that I wanted to talk about, it's actually on view downtown a bit at the Whitney in an exhibition called Inheritance that was curated by Rujeko Hockley there. And I start with this piece, one, because you have an opportunity to see it, it's up for a couple more weeks, but also because it's a self-portrait. Um, it's kind of an unusual self-portrait. It's, un it's a self-portrait by looking at my lineage on my father's side and a self-portrait more based on who you are in relation to and that as a way of locating yourself. So basically you can see there's this rainbow kind of spectrum. It starts from reds and oranges, yellows, moves into blues and purples. That's kind of a formal strategy for thinking about how to make a bunch of small things actually be one big thing together. And then the piece, um, obviously it hangs over this holographic glitter couch, kind of thinking about the way families display photographs and the kind of museum that is maybe your aunt's living room. Um, there's drawings, collage, cell phone pictures, and then these, like the red text piece is a spray paint on paper. And the this is the kind of structure of the piece is around these family names. So Cassandra's great, great granddaughter down to Uncle Rodney's daughter. Again, those are all me, but in a relational kind of way. I hope that makes sense. Um, as well as like these moments of pizzas and birthday cakes, weddings and parties, California city skies, cars, living rooms, and a bunch of them are adorned with rhinestones that seem to animate the everyday scenarios with a bit of otherworldly magic. And also that's me. I guess they were with a little red crayon. Um, so this is from one of the ways that I work. Um, I call them text compositions. So the that's where I make graphic drawings using just words. Sometimes they're bold and simple. Sometimes they're detailed and intricate. And these works are really trying to fit the biggest concepts into the smallest amount of information. So this piece, it's actually the word sister repeated multiple times, kind of creating this quilt-like pattern or maybe a chain link pattern. And thinking about, again, trying to use the smallest word to think about these really big ideas. You know, sister is everything from a familial bond to the different types of sisterhoods that we choose and create. It has a bit of a political connotation to it. It's gendered, but not necessarily binary. So again, small word, big ideas, lots of hours, detailed drawing. Um, my process for drawing is kind of the opposite of improvisational or gestural. It's um, pr 
pretty wound up <laughs> and kind of <laughs> tight. Um, and there's so much attention to the detail that it actually obscures the handmade unless you, you know, really get up close to it. And so it kind of rewards um, a really dedicated viewer. And this, you can see that the drawing then became a wallpaper. So often in my work, things are kind of modular and iterated and they keep making different appearances um, as different mediums. So now this is a wallpaper. Um, again, another glitter couch and these glittered speakers. And then above it, above it hangs a photo of my Auntie Viv. She's kind of relaxing in a space that she actually created. So she like sewed these couch cushions and, you know, obviously put a lot of effort and attention into the presentation of this beautiful space. And so I love that she's taking a moment to relax in this space that she's made. And I also just wanted to shout out Auntie Viv at the Met. So there she is. <laughs> um, here's another of the text compositions. This one is called Feelings Recursive. And I was trying to do a grant application recently and I was supposed to write a little bit about each piece and I couldn't write anything about this. So I just wrote big, big feelings, feelings on feelings on feels, stacked up feelings, feelings on loop, exponential feelings, towering feelings, skyscraper feelings. Um, here's a detail of how intricate and weird it gets. This is um, powdered graphite on paper. So there's like a lot of stenciling and honestly the stencil is what takes the longest to make. And then the powdered graphite gets like brushed into the paper, kind of penetrates the surface of the paper. Speaker stacks. Um, I'm looking at these as like tools for communication, amplification of culture, and they're painted with automotive paint what we call candy paint, um, really trying to pay tribute to like the car culture of my California upbringing and also the generative act of creating something grand and monolithic out of something ordinary. So whether it's rims on a car, rhinestones on a manicure or the flourishes of home decor, these acts of adornment I think are really the ways that we become ourselves, that we announce ourselves and that we find each other. And then one project that was briefly mentioned in the introduction is what I call the FBI project, wherein after my family filed a Freedom of Information Act request and after about four years of going back and forth with the FBI, we received a 500 page surveillance file that was amassed on my father during his time working with the Black Panthers in Southern California and his time working with Angela Davis to secure her freedom and save her life in the Bay Area. And I'm not gonna go super in depth, but the you know, document really details the routine surveillance of my father by special agents, harassment and intimidation of family and friends, the solicitation of informants to infiltrate the black power movement. And when I first studied this document, my thought was just like, wow, I'm really lucky that my dad is alive. I'm lucky that he lived to tell the story and I'm lucky that I was born. And so my th second thought was, you know, I need to make this art. I need to make this do something. I need to tell this story. So I've done that in a lot of different material ways. These are two photographs. Um, I scanned them, they're like small Polaroids. I scanned them at a high resolution, blew them up to almost life size. The left, it's 1966, and the right, it's 1968. Um, there's a lot that you can infer from that. Um, and the wallpaper is created from stamps from within the FBI file. Um, and like I said, I'm not gonna go into a super in-depth history, but you know, at this time, J. Edgar Hoover is the head of COINTELPRO, and he's just violating um, constitution left and right, and as I, I'll recommend a couple books also if you're curious to learn more about that history. Um, but as I continued working with this project and the source material, I started working with these large scale drawings to kind of take up more space. And I inverted tonally the 
pages from black text on white to white text with these dark black powdered graphite um, fields. If you were to see this in real life and not on a screen, it's really, really deep and dark, but also it has a kind of metallic sheen to the graphite. So it reflects light a little bit. And also there's some cloudiness in real life that you can't see here. Um, this is the one image within the file, which is this mugshot of my dad. He was never arrested or charged for anything, but just like hauled down a couple times to uh, probably get his photograph taken while picketing outside of the Marin courthouse with Angela Davis. Um, here's a detail of the colored pencil details on the drawing, which really pop out against that powdered graphite. I'm also adding these roses to really kind of create my own lexicon, my own, you know, layer of redaction or coding that would be kind of a counter surveillance. Um, also thinking about roses are the way that we often show that we love each other, um, that we take care of each other, these, you know, domestic rituals of care. Other times I use these holographic um, vinyl additions. In this case, they're like redacting the redactions. Again, thinking about maybe a restorative technology or some type of magic um, <clears throat> scrambling that would happen with this like secret technology that I've invented. Um, <laughs> this is a kind of gives you a sense of the scale of the drawings and then this sculpture, which again, pointing to the domestic, these living room spaces. It's got, again, these uh, glitterized surveillance cameras. And then these are just a couple books that I would recommend if you're curious about this history. Um, Eric Huggins and Stephen Shames recently came out with this book, Women of the Panther Party, which is a gorgeous book and a lot of, um, you know, intentional misremembering about the Panthers is like this big macho thing, but over 50% of the membership were women at some points. The Burglary, it reads like a thriller, but it's true. So that's an amazing book. And then um, I want to quickly frame the Eagle Creek Saloon Project since you can see um, that work upstairs. Jamal Batts wrote this gorgeous um, description of the project. Maybe I'll just read it because then it'll be faster than me trying to think of how to explain it as well as he did, but it's uh, Sadie Barnett's The New Eagle Creek Saloon 2019 to Ongoing is a bar, a time traveling spectacle constructed for queer revelry that just so happens to every so often land in the art world. Its mighty real function as an art object is disrupted by its potential for conviviality, its ability to attract an audience and its invitation to sit at its stools, relax your arm on the bar top and grab a drink. There's so much to admire about this meticulously con rounded construction. The way it's sick, slick silver curves offer comfort, its bold fluorescent pink neon sign beckons passerby, and its hologra hologram paper calls for an eternal birthday party that starts at childhood and carries us forth into its burning yet possible present. The new Eagle Creek provides all of this, but like any good bar, it requires you, the crowd, on its proverbial dance floor to turn it on. So this is the bar that has been traveling around for the last five years to different museums. And it really is a stage and a platform to invite um, all kinds of archiving and storytelling and performance and flirtation and drinking and fun. And um, it was at the kitchen in 2022, um, you know, obviously, how the object was made and constructed is really important and it references so much of my you know, aesthetic and I felt like that was important to honor the history but to do it in my vocabulary. But I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of the detail shots about how it looks and just get to you know, the part where it really comes to life which is with the people. Um, so this is my friend Redwood Hill, Tending Bar. This is an amazing performer, Miss Little, when the piece was at SF MoMA. Um, you know, you can see there's just so many different ways to interact with the object. This is like a time-lapse video um, of my partner, Stephen and I building the thing and then inviting people in. So I think this kind of helps to show what 
what happened. But really the thing that I wanted to illuminate was the fact that my dad opened this bar because of the racism that him and his friends would experience at the white gay bars in San Francisco. And they just had nowhere to be, um, to be together, to be you know coming out and coming together and finding each other. And so for three years, he ran this amazing space, um, but there was no Netflix documentaries about it. It wasn't something grad students were studying, you know, in queer theory classes. If I was a documentary filmmaker, I would have just made a documentary, but I'm an artist, so I made an art and it seems kind of unwieldy and complicated, but it's been really fun. And um, it's, um, okay, we also put it on a flatbed truck and rode it through SF Pride in 2019. Um, Carvel Wallace was able to join us. You can see Carvel there. Um, we had a really great time. I think there was like from eight months old to 80 years old on that float. Um, this is my dad. He is a living, breathing, collaborating part of this story and this work, which is amazing. So um, he gets to you know, tell the story in his own words and I am so grateful for that. And then I created these, um, I call them mini bars, <laughs> versions that could you know, stand alone and tell the story even without um, us you know, taking over these entire spaces. And so this is the piece that's on view upstairs. And you can see that it, you know, has these musical equipment um, in the front, kind of feels almost like a jukebox or something. Um, again, this inviting curvature and shiny surfaces. And then you've got the photograph, the collage of photographs from the bar that hang on top of it. Um, and they really, I think make you feel like you're there in the bar space. You can hear the glasses clinking and like, you know, the jokes and there's cakes being cut, champagne glasses, a lot of like overlapping arms and friendly gestures. And um, I was really thinking about the type of photography that happens in a bar, um, especially before cell phones. Um, this is another version that I created, I was having the hardest time figuring out how, I wanted to make a little series and I wanted them to be similar but different. And I kept trying to make them have different shapes. And then finally I realized that what I needed to do was think about sneaker design and you have like the same shape but different colorways. And so once I figured out the different colorways, I was able to like make these pieces live together. And I was so stuck on that. Um, Anyway, the kind of last thing that I want to leave with is just what I'm working on in the studio most recently, which are these how-to series of drawings. So these are colored pencil, and there's some photographs mixed in as well, some collage, powdered graphite, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about them more together, but that is where I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm going to, it's my honor to invite um, Carvel Wallace up to join me so we can chat together. Thank you. Hey. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, thanks for coming out tonight, um, or today, this afternoon. Um, that was so great uh, to see all your work in context, um, even though I've interacted with it in all these different ways. And so I guess the, the first question that I want to ask you was um, a question that I hate, actually, which is, <laughs> not, it's a version of how are you doing, but it's specific to how are you caring for yourself right now? And also, how are you caring for your creative instrument? like the whatever it is that is in you that generates your work. Mm. All right, we're getting right into it. That, right into that it. makes sense. No um, I, I think I'm, I'm doing well. There's a lot to, you know, like process and metabolize um, together and individually, but I think knowing that like we're all doing that kind of helps since I'm always <laughs> kind of perpetually worried about everything and doing that and how I'm taking care. I'm drinking a lot of tea 
I'm like always I'm on the airplane, like, I'll just have hot water, please. I, I brought my own tea. Um, drinking a lot of tea, trying to go to bed early and just, you know, give grace and gratitude and start over and just kind of do the best yeah. that we can. But really, it's the tea. Yeah, it's the tea. It's really <laughs> interesting. Um, oh, good question. Um, I'm really into spearmint tea oh, good. as good well as ashwagandha. The classics. Um, there is a feeling... I think because there are so many things happening in the world that seem frustrating and out of our control, uh, I feel like it's natural for an artist to question the role of their work. Like, what, are, what am I, is this, you know? And I feel like when I was growing up, it was like, well, you make art, you can save the world. It's just, you know, people will connect and you'll tell stories. And uh, I, th I don't know if I believe that the same way I did when I was like 20. Um, not that it's not true, but I, I don't know if I believe it the same way. And I'm curious about what you feel like the role of your work is today. Yeah, I think um, I think because I kind of make work about people who dared to try to change the world. I both spend a lot of time thinking about changing the world and also I get to spend time being a, like questioning that like it's about changing the world but I don't think of myself I don't think of myself as an activist I think of myself as an artist and I, it's not to say that you can't be both or that they can't both help each other but to me it's a little bit of a different like job description yeah. you know because I have spent so much time thinking about activists as organizers and like the things that you do in a day mm -hmm. to get to the meeting and get the fundraising and you know so I think of my work as like being concerned with the world um and I don't know if it can change but I know that thinking about changing it is an important way to move through the world and that that can change you and that that might be enough and so and I also think that you know there's these long slow kinds of ways that art and music um, can work on and kind of s let people see themselves and whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's, you know, organizing or activism or vaccine research, like that they get to have their own um, experience and hopefully take something from it that helps them do their thing. And that's kind of beyond me. Um, so it just seems like there's all these ways that it might be good. So why not right. do it? Because even if it's a 50, 50 chance, right. and coincidentally, it's well, the only thing I know, like how to right. do. So, yeah. Well, it does raise the question of like, I, we know each other through in Oakland. I live in Oakland too. And so I know that like you are, there's, such a, a legacy of activism in Oakland and there's people have so many different relationships to that legacy, a feeling of like, well, they, this earlier generation really did it and we can never do it enough, or we have to do something even more intense, but you're always wrestling on some level with the legacy of the Black Panthers and everything ancillary to that. Um, and so as a person, also not to, not to mention the fact that Black Panthers are very kind of like uh, culturally sexy, right? Everyone's got like an idea. As soon as you hear black, I was like, oh, wow, guys with guns. What do you hear about that? Leather jackets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm curious about, for you as someone who grew up with these people or surrounded by them and, and they're still at your house, and what is something that you know about what that activism means that people from the outside don't know? I think, um, I think, so especially when it comes to the Panthers and thinking about my father and he's just such a, like for one thing, he never used to really talk about being in the Panthers. Like it, he wasn't kind of, wasn't something he wore on his sleeve. Um, I think there was a lot of painful memories, you know, people were killed, um, people didn't make it. So it was a hard thing to talk about, but I think when, the 50th anniversary came around, not so much in relation to that anniversary, but I think there's just something that happens at that mark of 50 years where you realize like this is bigger than me, this is a 
actual history that people are hungry to learn about and seeing how many young people were wanting to learn about it, it really kind of opened him up. But he's just such a, um, you know, kind of warm and um, tender and kind person that I think it's so easy to see that kind of, you know, stereotype and myth of like the macho bravado just fall apart. And I think one thing that I've learned through knowing like, you know, the insiders is that it was so much a project of love. It was a project of, you know, free ambulance programs and free food programs. You know, I mean, J. Edgar Hoover famously said the most dangerous thing about the Panthers was the free breakfast program mm -hmm. um, because of how it would galvanize, you know, hearts and minds. Um, but there were over 60 services that the Panthers were doing, you know, um, especially like think about something like Erica Huggins, like yeah. you see that like, this was like a, this is, this is family. This is protecting families. This is like a, a waging a love war for families and communities. And so I think that, and also just like how much more, you know, queerness there was, obviously the language was different. And I tried to remind people like, just because the language that we use now wasn't there, don't let, like yourself be erased from that history. Like we've always been everywhere. Um, but also just that people were just being people, you know, like they were still concerned about like their outfits and like, <laughs> and partying and who was like, like they weren't yeah, like, also, like waiting. Like in their 20s too. Yeah, like they're yeah. just like <laughs> figuring it out and yeah. they're not like waiting for the world in order to to be their fully best selves and their funniest selves and their most beautiful selves and their best cooking selves, you know, like it's your one life at a time that we know of. So like you also just got to live it, you know, like. Yeah. Well, the thing about the free breakfast program really struck me because um, like ultimately they co-opted that. Right. I mean, like that's part of where free breakfast for children came from. That is like universally available was because of the power of it through the Black Panthers. And it reminded me of the FBI piece. There is a stamp on the cover of one of those pages that says, do not destroy, um, like historical archives. And when I was looking at it there, it dawned on me, well, isn't that, isn't that ironic? Because the this is a file of, this is how we destroyed a family. This is like our records of everything we did to destroy a movement in a family. Make sure you don't destroy this file because it's actually belongs in the archives. And I can't help but to see the parallel sitting in a museum of that line of thinking. Um, and I, I wonder if, like how that impacted your approach to the work, this idea that like the FBI was so precious about these archives of like them trying to destroy your father. I mean, yeah, the, the first time that I showed that that work in a solo exhibition was called Do Not Destroy for that exact <laughs> reason, which was like, what can happen if I then like appropriate the FBI's language and now I'm saying yeah. do not destroy and now I'm using this drawing so that my father's story can't be destroyed. Um, so it's exactly that. And yeah, reading through the files, you're like, my dad will talk about having this experience where, you know, he was one of 11 siblings and he'll... He knows the order that everyone was born, but he'll forget a birthday, like there's 11, you know? But in the FBI document, he's like, oh, perfect, my family tree. <laughs> um, so it's, <laughs> yeah, the, the ironies abound. <laughs> um, a lot of your work, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that piece um, and expand outward. When I look at the, those FBI files, what I always think of is, uh, there's this whole world of like, you know, like society and men and like guns and stuff. And they're like, we're going to stop the movement and make the movement. And then there's on the one hand, then there's this little girl on the other hand being like, no, that's my dad. Like, st stay away. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And that's what the, the army, I've heard you refer to the army of Hello Kitty stickers. And um, it's made me think about the way that you work with the imagery of like girlhood. And I wonder how you arrived at that. And can you talk a little bit about how you use girlhood in like um, in competition with state violence? I mean, I think that I've always gravitated towards like the kind of 
ways that people will construct an identity through using something like Hello Kitty, you know, like certain people, it's like, okay, I'm gonna have Hello Kitty in my car, Hello Kitty bathroom, Hello Kitty in my, like, you know, like my aunt has like a Betty Boop themed bathroom, like just the way that people kind of construct an identity for themselves out of like, you know, whatever is available. Um, so I've just loved that kind of the way that people adopt something and make it their own. Um, I've also always loved like, you know, over the top manicures and jewelry and just the way that people are like, you know, I'm here, this is a language I speak, like, do you speak it? Let's, you know, kind of do that dance. Um, and the same with like, you know, the scraper car culture in the Bay, like to take in an old, you know, kind of like junky car and making it amazing because the rims are sky high and the paint job is iridescent. Um, and so I've, there was, that stuff always used to kind of be behind the scenes of my work and then it just kind of started to creep up and creep into the work and then I realized that that was really what I wanted it to do sometimes and specifically with the pink in relation to the FBI files, I felt like that would be like the most kind of disruptive thing to do to like J. Edgar Hoover's files, you know, as opposed to like <laughs> ripping them or burning them or scribbling on them, like splashing them with pink would be the most like jarring <laughs> to the ghost of J. Edgar Hoover. It would be like a kryptonite, like this pink <laughs> glittering. Um, so that was really where I, I realized how sharp that pink tool could be. Um, and then of course, like with the Eagle Creek project, it comes in as this kind of like glow that people can see themselves in. But I love that it has a power to, I think I call it like a high femme aesthetic, you know? So it isn't like a binary and like, okay, pink is for girls, but it's like a, a language that people across the gender spectrum can um, embody and speak and kind of just play with and, uh, you know, you'll see like Cameron in like a big pink, mm -hmm. like fur coat. It's like just the ways that, or like pink Timberlands, just, it, it's, uh, it's just a device that can kind of like destabilize gender and also be very proud in a kind of right. high femme presentation well, of something. It also frivolous. strikes me. And I mean, the Cameron thing is like relevant because I remember I'm old enough to remember when that first happened. And the thing that really struck me, it's like one day you get in the train and like every dude would have pink, like a pink polo. And like all these kids who were just so hard would just be trying to rock pink all the time. And the thing that struck me was there was something um, so forceful about it because it was like, um, it was like this weird reverse co-opting of misogyny to be like, you think pink is bad because it's associated with girls. I'm so bad, I can wear pink and you won't do shit to me because I like transcend the power of it. So it's like this weird thing. And I've always felt that that was the case in your work too. There's something about being unbowed, right? Like by all of this stuff that A, you continue to show up um, with hope and you talk about your family doing that too. Like I'm going to live a full life regardless of what happens. But there's also something very specific about fantasizing about a better world. And when I looked at the Eagle Creek picture, I forgot which exhibit was, but the one which is sort of like against a black background, I, the word utopia came to mind. And it dawned on me when I was sitting there that so much of your work has to do with the, the willingness to imagine something so much better that everyone tells you can't be done. Like the, F, like the FBI is like, you can't have um, that one right there. Like that is a heavenly image. That is an image of a kind of utopia. And the white gay bars in San Francisco said, you can't have that. But your dad said, no, I think we will. And, you know, and America said to black, well, you can't have this. And the black mother said, no, I think we will. And I, I see that strain in your work that you continue to push past that. Like the FBI says, um, these names are going to be forever redacted. And you're like, no, I'm going to put glitter on them and magically unredact them. You just watch. Mm -hmm. And then as, 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 as viewers, we sit here and say, well, your glitter isn't going to magically unredact these names. That's ridiculous. But then after seeing so many iterations, you're like, well, maybe it'll work. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see if it'll work. I wonder how you react to that feeling that you're in a state of hopefulness. I mean, I think 
I think one part of it, like, okay, so you're saying, you know, like the white gay bars that were turning away my father and his friends that were asking them for three forms of ID. They were policing, you know, their dress and their dance. It's like this act of exclusion, but I'm like, in reality, really who's losing is like, all these amazing bar. people are not at your bar. Yeah. Or like he, he talks about um, at one space that it was kind of becoming like a, uh, um, the dance floor is like becoming like a dance kind of scene, uh -huh. even though it was just a jukebox. Um, and so yeah, like a lot of people of color were coming and dancing and then they came one week and all of the black music was gone from the jukebox, which I'm like, who are you hurting but yourself? <laughs> <laughs> So there's like it's a true cutting off your nose despite your face kind of situation. I mean, <laughs> truly. So it's like it's the it's this like, you know, exclusion that's happening, but it's like my dad and his friends are going to like, get their they're, life. They're the prize. They are the party. <laughs> right. Like so you're it's just like there's it's about both like acknowledging the inequities and also like not asking for inclusion, but just mm -hmm. celebrating what we mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. regardless. And so I think that, yeah, maybe the pink even mm -hmm. is about that. Like it's, it's a, it's just a, a shout out. Yeah. It's a recognition. Um, and it's like a, yeah, it's a vibe. Yeah. I, you know, that Pomona piece, can we go back to that real quick? Do you know where that is in the? Yeah, that, that, that. There's something so interesting about that piece that feels to me like it summarizes a lot of your work in, and it has to do, technically it has to do with the relationship between two dimensions and three dimensions. And a lot of your work has a like, 80% of it is in two dimensions. And then there's this one 3D sculpture in, in, the, in the middle. And that's what we have at the Whitney right now with the, with the couch, which I'm gonna ask you to talk about a little bit. And we have this here. And it almost feels to me like, and I wanna know if you were thinking this, it, also, it almost feels to me like it's a metaphor for how you deal with the past. That like the two dimension stuff is like, there's the past and it's archived and it's historical and it's this kind of stodgy thing but you flip this one switch and you bring one element of it into your face. It is now alive. And that table is in the center. And there's something that really strikes me every time I look at that exhibit from every angle it's been photographed, it strikes me that this history is looking at this present in this way that it's like you, you make things step out of the past. Does that, does that feel relevant to how you think about stuff? Yeah, it feels like I'm gonna steal that and <laughs> <laughs> write that in my next presentation. That's why it, artists need writers and writers need artists. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I think that's a, that's a perfect way to say it, like something stepped out, you yeah. kind of said is what I think. Yeah. I think also I like kind of um, like troubling one medium or one way of working. So even when I'm presenting something, I'm also kind of saying like, this is not the only way mm -hmm. to present something right. or like, you know, something is only big if something else is small. Something is only flat if something else is 3D. Something yeah. is only shiny and pink if something else is, you know, saturated, matte, yep. dark. Um, and so to have a bunch of wall works and then something pop out, it kind of like um, acknowledges that you're always making these medium choices mm -hmm. and that there are also other choices and that not everything is um like this authoritative mm -hmm. master work that's been arrived at but it's yeah yeah well it, it becomes like I, I would think wonderfully disorienting as a viewer because we're used to i don't know about you but i go to a museum and i immediately I'm like, well, these are the authorities, like some grownups made this and I'm just here to witness and whatever they say is cool. And, but then when I walk into a work of yours, there's a feeling of like, wait, I don't think that there is a grown up here. I <laughs> it might there be are me, no grown -ups. Key, like that's weird, <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, there's something about your work that feels anti-authoritative. Um, and I wonder if you think about that personally or that's just like as a natural outcropping of growing up where and when and how you did. Um, I think it's, it's probably both. It's also 
probably a combination and I, I want to be careful not to like undermine, you know, my own authorship or the things that I've learned creating things. But I think it really comes from like a, a deep unknowing mm. and uh, like I'm always iterating and things are quoting themselves and like it's appears in different ways in different times because I just don't ever think it's done and I'm kind of never mm -hmm. satisfied, mm -hmm. which I think is great because it's pushing you and you're continuing to try, but also it's kind of like you're never, you know, self-satisfied, but also I'm just, I'm never... I'm never sure. Like it, for anything that I could mm -hmm. tell you, I know for sure I could also tell you the opposite or for anything <laughs> that I think is mm -hmm. really important. I could also say, but then sometimes this and that mm -hmm. it's like this just very mm -hmm. um, like, but, and also way of thinking about things, which I think is also why I'm not necessarily like shouting a slogan. Mm -hmm. I'm like screaming <laughs> a scream and laughing mm -hmm. a laugh and these like mm -hmm. kind of um, more abstract even though they're deeply felt like um, sentiments. And so that's why they, it's not dogmatic. It's not for sure. It's slippery. So it's like unsure, but deeply invested. Right. There it is. That's the one. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Um, can you tell me why you picked that particular coffee table of all the coffee tables on planet earth? Um. I, Cause I love that table, but talk, talk to me about that table. I mean, it was, a found table, so I guess I was either, like, you know, going around the thrift stores trying mm -hmm. to find something that just felt, like, ubiquitous, um, and, like, you would just imagine, like, mm -hmm. which auntie had that table. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, kind of special because it has, like, you know, this beveled glass and the kind of slightly ornate legs, but it's, like, regular special. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and it also it kind of feels like a, a vitrine or some type of like presentation uh -huh. box. Yeah, right. And then we just replaced the bottom with um, like a laser cut mirror plexi and walnut wood. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like an inlay that mm -hmm. is the same roses that come from the drawings. Mm -hmm. The roses also, they're like, I like images of the flowers, but they're like icons. Right. Like, it's like clip yeah, art yeah, yeah. vibes, right. like the right. flower that you get on like the bodega bag. Right. Or like a greeting card. You right. know, they're not like, right. they're, they're like flowers about flowers. Right. Kind of sticker right. flowers. So that's. Well, you also get some of that with the, with the paper flowers in the. In the vase, in the vase, right? Oh, they're real. Oh, those flowers. are real flowers. Yes. Okay, no problem. Withdraw. Yeah. Um, which is <laughs> fun to like. I asked the museum, you know, can you change the flowers out oh, every week? Yeah. Which at first I thought might be like a high maintenance art request, <laughs> but then it turned out that like people would take them home um, um, at the end of every uh, week, and it kind of like became a sweet thing within oh the God. museum. So like, you never know what life your works are living on their own. It's interesting about the, the flowers because the clip art icon thing really struck me because it reminded me of what I used to call when I was a teenager office art because my mother, I'd go to my mother's like office. Yeah. And she would, it was like the, the, the visual lexicon of my mother and all the women that she worked with were these references to things, but never the things. Like you wouldn't have real flowers because you can't, you're in the middle of some accounting office. So you have to have paper flowers and you have to have little pictures of flowers. Um, and that became their aesthetic. And it felt like that was a reference to my mother and all of her sisters, their attempts to create life and beauty in these lifeless, unbeautiful places. Yeah. Um, you do often, you've created a lexicon of your own and you often take pieces of it and remix them and sample your own work. Like you did, like the sister drawing is the one that, you know, I saw people react to the hand drawing of that, especially that detail. And then you remix it as a, as a, um, as wallpaper. And I'm wondering how you arrived at the idea that you're going to, or did you sort of actively decide, like, I'm going to set out to make my own lexicon, like the dictionary of Sadie, and then I'm going to use all the words from it. Or did that just evolve naturally over time because you wanted to keep exploring things? Yeah, I think it was a, a process of just, keeping on 
attempting and attempting and attempting and uh -huh. getting closer and closer and kind of honing in on things and also realizing, I mean, it, it really started, I think, with um, bookmaking or zine making mm. when I was in grad school because I realized that with a zine, just because of like everything is going to be printed on the same paper and the same size mm -hmm. and folded and stitched together, it kind of unifies everything. And so you can have all these really disparate references and they become unified. Yes. And, and that was when I was really able to pull in all these, like it's the Hello Kitty, it's the yeah. nails, it's everything gets to live together. And I yes. realized that it was like the, all these things being together was doing something that yes. was more than they could do on their own. And another part of it, I also often sometimes say that, you know, even though I'm very concerned with how things are made, I don't think of my practice as really like a relationship to making in a ritual kind of way that maybe I, you know, imagine maybe some painters. Even though you do that drawing, which is even though feels a little rich. I do the drawing. It's like when I do that, I almost feel like I'm like a copy machine or something. <laughs> like I'm just like uh -huh. doing it to make I see. the thing, even though that's my favorite part uh -huh. is the drawing. It's like very meditative and I can like listen to your Fred yeah. Rogers podcast <laughs> and stuff. Um, but it's less like I'm compelled to make and uh -huh. it's more like I'm compelled to see. I see. And so I think the lexicon uh -huh. comes from, it's just, mm -hmm. it's how I see mm -hmm. the world. It's how I see everything in it. Um, it's more about the perspective of seeing than it is about like, generating something from my imagination. And so it's just kind of becomes a catalog mm -hmm. of how I see things mm -hmm. and they end up becoming like this language. I love this point that you made about scenes. And I know that I ever made that connection as to why that was so satisfying to make scenes in the nineties, but it's true that you could take all these disparate forces and by photocopying them, they became one, they became a collage of, but not a collage of multiple things one thing mm -hmm. and there's something that felt very spiritually aligned with how we were experiencing the world in the 90s that got to that so um with to that end i want to ask you a little bit about the how-to project tell me about what because that came from zines right yeah, yeah. <clears throat> i mean yeah that, so that that project came from these zines i was making in like 2012 um and i recently in my studio just kind of wanted to revisit something that i was making before um, I was really engaging with like these archives or these histories or before there was any possible chance that anyone would expect anything from a work of mine. Um, so I wanted to revisit something from, from, from a different moment in my journey. And so I went back to the zines and decided to make drawings of the text within them. So they're like mm. how to's, how to catch fruit flies, how to draw a diamond, how to swallow pills. There are all these questions. And of course there's not exactly answers, mm -hmm. but it's like using this formal device of a how to as a way to be personal or be like emotional without being personal mm -hmm. and be kind of um, like, it's just something about the structure of the how-to allows you to yeah. say anything well, it, that you wouldn't necessarily admit that you, you wouldn't admit, would yeah. even you Well, know, it does be that kind about. of like six-word story thing of like implying a lot without actually saying it like for sale, baby suit was never worn. It's like, I don't know what's going on with this person, but clearly they've got a lot going on. <laughs> like they're trying to take pills, they're trying to take naked pictures, they're catching fruit flies, they're trying to deal with watermelons. The, you know, it's like, uh, so there's something really, literally, there's something really beautiful about that. Um, and I always love when art uh, gets a piece of literature in it and does the the evocation of poetry by the use of text. And so I know you think of yourself as an artist, but you're a writer too, because you're doing this magic trick of saying a sentence, putting together five words and evoking an entire story out of it. Um, I want to open with 253, so I want to open the floor to questions if people have them. I have a microphone if you raise your hand, I'll <clears> come over. Maybe while you get questions going I'll just also say like that the font is also a really I want to talk um, about that font that font is in my book and I was really excited to see it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a it's just another opportunity to like make a picture with in a set of constraints yeah which could be like a font um but yeah this font is cooper black yeah and I think of it as like 
the iron on letters, yeah. you know, for like totally. t-shirt. Yeah, or yeah, when you're, yeah, when you make like a little, little like league softball or something. team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like, um, you see on a lot of storefronts and advertisements, it just seems again, kind of like a DIY. Yes, that's right. Um, has some character to it, but, but a very not, neat DIY because it's like a serif font, so it has a certain authority to it. Yeah, yeah it's not like goofy. Yeah. It still feels a little put together, yeah. and it doesn't like take away from what's being said. Yeah. As I don't think a font ought to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Strong opinions about fonts. Yeah. <laughs> We're opening up but, the floor to font chat. Welcome to font talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to bounce back on, hi, sorry, thank you so much for this incredible conversation. It was really stimulating. Um, but I want to bounce back on something that, Sadie, you said about those flowers and uh, the work having a life on its own once it's out of your studio, basically. Um, how do you feel about having those, you know, those uh, site-specific works move around and then eventually end up in a museum collection in a, you know, maybe a bit more sterile of a place, sterile of a place than let's say a performance space like the kitchen. Um, how do you interact with that? Do you expect people to eventually gather community centric performances or how, how do you feel about having that, that not be a part of the kind of 3d lively experience anymore? Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming to see you. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think everything just has to live, everything can like only do what it's set up to do, you know? Um, and so I think that like the, the 2D things are gonna live their 2D lives and the wild installations are gonna live their wild lives. They both have advantages and disadvantages and they both kind of help fuel the other um, mode of being. So for example, like the mini bar that's upstairs, you know, it doesn't get to be like a raucous party, but it also gets to be, you know, in conversation with Felix Gonzalez Torres and it gets to, um, you know, approach an audience that might not be expecting it, or it gets to approach somebody who very much would be like at the kitchen hanging out, but they're having a different day. And then they're like, oh wow, this also can bleed into this space or even infiltrate this space and kind of, um, you know, infiltrate the archives of art history. And so I think everything kind of gets to move in its own way. And sometimes you control where it goes and sometimes you don't. Um, but I think that each, each piece doesn't get to do more than like the kind of, um, like treasure hunt of all the disparate pieces that are all in different places. And that web that's holding them together is like the real um, kind of, the real like, yeah, it's like the, the life force mm -hmm. of my work is mm -hmm. the connection. Like mm -hmm. now I'm getting like pattern master or something, but like mm -hmm. the thing that ties them all together is the real thing and then any one thing is like a representation of that thing. Um, yeah, it strikes me that there's a real, I mean, change in how I think I inherited the notion of art when I was coming up, which is that you're this great artist, you make this great thing and the world has changed as a result that we've all sort of arrived at like, you just do your thing and you let it go. Like you, that it's collaborative. You collaborate with the audience, you collaborate with reality, you collaborate with the universe, you collaborate with where this piece goes. There's a kind of humility in the way that I think we look at it now that it wasn't what I was taught art was supposed to be like. So, um, yeah, any I think, other? I think we have time for one more yeah. question. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. And uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of you um, and your grace as I find my words because I am unsure but deeply invested <laughs> in, 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 as, in uh, asking my question and just connecting with you in this way. Um, I practice narrative medicine at the intersections of art and health and social justice and narrative humility comes to mind when I, when I um, heard your conversation today and saw some of your art, so I appreciate that. Uh, I, just, I also wanted to comment on this sense of um, secret technology that you invented and um, 
and the connection to your ancestors in, in that. Uh, it, br it brought to mind your art and that saying brought to mind the um, underground railroad messaging and mapping of the quilts and quilting and also the um, black culture wallpaper that is a, a movement. Uh, and I just wanted to say all that and ask you if you felt yes to speaking a little bit more about the connection with your ancestors in your work. Yeah, I mean, I, I like um, kind of that linking that imagined technology to the kind of maybe codes or encoded messages, um, which I also think a lot think a lot about um, like these, I mean, in that case, it's, they're like very, you know, life or death um, codes, but I also think about just the kind of like a, a shout out or a, a wink or a, something that someone's gonna pick up in the work that somebody else might not pick up as like a kind of code. I mean, Carvel had mentioned to me um, about his daughter seeing the piece at the Whitney and like not necessarily knowing that the artist was from the Bay Area, but finding these like little Bay Area clues within it. And that is important to me um, without like spelling it out. It's just kind of embedded in there. And then, yeah, I mean, when it comes to my ancestors, it's like, um, you know, if you, sometimes you say the word a lot of times, you can almost forget um, like the how serious and how much gravity there is and also like, that people are just like people, you know, even if they came before you and did these amazing things and you wouldn't be here without them, they also just get to be like messy, complicated, silly, serious people who fell in love and had lived lives. Um, but it's just impossible for me not to think about like the world that I walk in, um, especially as like, an artist and thinking about all of the black artists that came before me and all the women artists that came before me, all the black women artists that came before me. And by before me, I mean like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, 30 years ago. Like it's just, it's impossible not to like kind of have all of that with me and behind me. Um, yeah. There was one, I know, we, I just I want to hear your question. Yeah. Um. I just wanted to say thank you both for such a dynamic conversation. Um, I'm really drawn to the power of the archive, especially through like written or pictorial um, usage. But I guess one, I just kind of want to know like what other archives are you interested in looking into? Um, and especially working um, with a Black Studies Collaboratory at Berkeley with Lee Rayford, who is my mentor for yeah. college. So um, <laughs> I've my like first experience with your work was um, in her class when I was like, I think in my second year. Um, so I just want to know like how how you're thinking of archives, so, like going into the future. What are you interested in? What part of like your family archival history are you wanting to look into more? Um, Thank you for that. And definitely shout out to Lee Rayford and the Black Studies Collaboratory. Um, just a generative beyond words experience. And, um, you know, the archives really kind of found me in, in my case. I wasn't like, oh, I'm an artist who's interested in the archives. It was more just like, you better do something with this history because who else is going to? You're literally the only person who is like the daughter of Rodney Barnett and an artist. So, um, so I don't know exactly um, what you know I'll do next in in that regard. But I have a feeling that things just will find me in the ways that they that they need to. Um, I mean, I also kind of want to ask Carvel if you don't mind if maybe you could say a little bit about, you know, what you're working on. Carvel has an, a memoir that's coming out in May. I wondered if maybe you, um, if maybe you could just give a little tiny Okay, just uh, about really that. quick because it's overtime. But uh, yeah, the book is called Another Word for Love and it's a memoir about the, the recovery from childhood trauma, but it's positioned as a kind of um, 
spiritual necessity at a time of change and transformation and destruction. It's like that we do this recovery so that we can do liberation collectively. And it's not about individual recovery. It's about, I don't know how to recover from my own trauma, but I know how to love or try to love and get hurt loving. And let's build on that. And that this might be how we move forward. So it's a series of memories, essays, stories, some poetic stuff around that movement, but it tells the story of my, life and recovery from stuff. Um, and I, I do think about this question of archives a lot. And I, I think I want to, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I'm going, I'm going to Birmingham to look at my family archives a little bit in, in the coming weeks. I don't know if anything will come up, but yeah, I, I think it's an open question that um, we always have to be looking for what has been missed. Yeah. Yeah. And what yeah. can like speak through the, yeah through the noise and the dust, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, both both of us will continue to do things. The Eagle Creek Project is traveling mm -hmm. to the Walker Museum. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is moving around, you can check that out. So just like keep in touch and keep spending your afternoons thinking about art and complicated things. Yeah. And I hope we get to do more of this yeah, soon. Yeah. Um, and thanks again, thank Fran you. and Lisa, for having Thank you both thank you. so much, Carvel Wallace, Sadie Barnett. We can't thank you enough. Um, everyone, please go see the exhibition upstairs. You can see Sadie's piece. Um, and, and thank you so much. We can't thank you enough.